Well, g'day everybody and welcome to episode 7 of Shoeforia, the podcast where footwear myths are made and broken. You can enjoy this on all of your favourite podcast channels and please remember to follow us, like us, share our content that we present on Facebook, Twitter and of course Instagram. Episode 7 is another cracking episode. In fact, we're doing something we've never done before and that is having a repeat guest. Martin Shorten, who was our guest in episode six, was so interesting and had so much more information to share with us that we had him back to back. And so we've got him again today. And let me tell you, it's a very interesting podcast. Martin's, as you learned from episode six, is never short of an opinion. And he, in this episode, casually throws a few hand grenades into the running footwear bunker and blows it up big time. Not the least of which is his assertion that categorizing footwear into motion control, cushioning or stability categories is absolutely crazy and not scientifically sustainable. What this means is that retail, dietary profession and physiotherapy is often doing it wrong. So if you're making your prescriptions based on categorizing footwear in these categories, you need to stop doing it because we can't support it with the science. He presents a very interesting model that might be far more useful. It's called the performance protection spectrum, and it talks about recommending footwear based on where the athlete fits within a spectrum and what their individual needs might be. A far more sensible approach, I would have thought. He also introduces us to a new concept to most, I think, which he's done a lot of work on with other researchers, and it's the concept of grounded running. I think you'll find it incredibly interesting. It has some quite interesting clinical application in relation to injury prevention. Finally, well, not finally, but the other big issue that he talks about is the importance of rocket soles in shoes that have a carbon fiber plate, a subject dear to my own heart. It's something we haven't talked about much, but I've always thought that the rocket sole in shoes like the Vaporfly 4%, the Next% percent, and the Alphafly is an incredibly important part of the shoe, representing change geometry that helps to overcome some of the negative aspects of some of the technology in those shoes. So a very interesting concept there, and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. There are definitely some clinical pearls in this podcast, so don't miss it. Episode 7 of Shoeforia with Dr. Martin Shorten. I'm Simon Bartold. I'm sure you'll enjoy it, and we'll see you again very soon. You're listening to the Shoeforia podcast by Bartold Clinical. Listen in as we delve deep into the world of evidence-based sports science, sports medicine, and athletic footwear science. Let's go and Okay, well, hi, everybody, and welcome to episode seven of Shoeforia. You know, we've had some fantastic speakers on the podcast to date. We've had the likes of Ben Nig and Alex Hutchinson, Jeff Dengate, but we've never had somebody go back to back in the history, short history of this podcast, but we have now because my chat with Dr. Martin Shorten was so interesting yesterday that we ran out of time. So we've got him back today, and Martin, thank you so much. Welcome back, day two, round two of our discussion, and thanks very much for joining us again. Hey, thank you, Simon. It's my pleasure. So we left our discussion, which was which I found absolutely fascinating. It's not often you get to chat with somebody who has worked with the likes of Bill Bowman and Phil Knight. It was very, very interesting. We left the discussion there with what I guess really was the next stage for you after you'd left Nike and Puma. And I know that Biomechanica was on the scene or in the future, but you did allude to some other ventures that occurred in the uh, the period between Biomechanica getting up and going and, and you leaving the majors. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yes. Well, the so after Nike, I, was, I went to Puma and was director of their international research design and development program, which is where I got my baptism in the trenches in Asia mm-hmm. on the product development side. And, you know, and as head of R&D, you have to work very closely with everybody in the company, the, the, the marketing people, the salespeople, the financial people. So that was a fantastic experience for me. Um, and I was kind of doing a lot of traveling, which is which was fine until my then wife was diagnosed with a terminal illness and you know I, I had to basically quit and go home. Puma were great. They kept paying me th- they paid me through the duration of my contract so I could stay home with her while she was ill and also after she passed so I could still have a, a year off. And during that time I reflected a lot and decided I really didn't want to go back into 
the you know the running around the world in that executive role. And the money was great, but I'd already lost what you know something more than money could ever buy me back. So I decided then that I would go into my own business, which wasn't novel for me because after I finished my PhD and before I came to the United States, I had my own consulting business in Cambridge, actually doing mostly computer system development and programming related to biomechanical applications and other applications, related engineering applications. So, you know, I had a, uh, got a lot of experience at Puma and thoroughly enjoyed it and worked with some good people, but I didn't, you know, just after... Life events changed my course a little bit. And I did actually get straight away into my own business in the, uh, you know, just driven out of the attic. And I hooked up with an old guy, a consultant I worked with at Puma, who was starting up a project with using some molded cushioning systems, twin sheet thermoform cushioning systems. And he and I and some investors started a company. And this is where I started doing work on a lot of different cushioning applications, from surfaces to helmets to, you know, military protective gear and vehicle impact attenuation and just a lot of kind of different cushioning applications from the one that we we usually deal with. And that kind of, from there, I got a very broad view of cushioning and how it works and a very different understanding of how it works than what I'd learned from just looking at, at footwear. At that time, one of our technologies that we had invented was licensed by Nike. Nike wanted to keep me off the market, so they hired me on one of these consulting contracts that doesn't involve much work, but allows enough money for me not to have to work for other people. And so I used that. That gave me the opportunity to actually get an office and get some staff and start doing other things other than what the projects I was doing for Nike, which were also on cushioning. I was able to do more work for Skydex, the company that I had been helped found, and also get involved in some other projects that were just not athletic shoe related for about seven years. So I was just all, but at the same time, I was able through Nike, having that resource available to me and having some of their research staff assist, you know, assigned to assist me when I needed it. We actually got some good basic research done. The two papers in 2011, which were actually not published until a decade after the work was done, were both done with the Nike Sport Research Lab and in, you know, with my co-author, Dr. Martin Minches is a, you know, is a Nike researcher. And there are two pretty good papers. The one that we talked about yesterday, one on the ground reaction force impact peak, and one on the interaction between cushioning and curvature in cushioning designs. Those are the two studies that we published, but we did a whole bunch of other things as well, including you know, the, some of the first pressure distribution statistical maps of, of differences and analysis of variance mapped out on the sole, you know, basically from calculated from pressure distributions, but doing this cell-by-cell cell type analyses. So we did a lot of good basic research in those days too, as well as you know, when I was at Nike and had a lot of freedom. And plus I was able to explore all these other non-footwear related applications and even got into apparel for Nike and others and Swift suits, right. uh, skating, I, uh, running suits and skating suits. I know you've told me before that you did what sounded like a, was a very interesting project and you were telling me that apparently the US Marines have very secretive very very fast boats I think you told me they can do 100 miles an hour or 160 kilometers an hour I didn't and they say go- that. officially they it, it is in excess of 60 miles an hour officially right yeah, so, so they can, so you they can, can say 100 them. kilometers an hour but unofficially you know they I mean you know, I don't have access to the actual information, but based on we were we were measuring, you uh, just using accelerometers to measure the shock input at people's feet and uh, how much got tr- transmitted through to the, the spine because they were uh, people were having to drop out of the Navy SEALs because of back issues mm. related to the pounding they take by going over waves at very very high speed. Mm. And we found accelerations of twelve to fifteen Gs at the spine, which where you'd normally expect it wow. to be like, you know, two or standing still, you'd expect it to be one. Walking you'd expect it to be one and a half, and running you'd expect it to be two and a half. We were finding ten or twelve. And so we engineered one of our cushioning technologies to put a, an impact attenuating deck in the bottom of the boat so that they would to help reduce that risk factor. Protect them, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, it's fascinating stuff. I, I'm, you know, I'm trying to do the calculation of how long it would take you to get from Florida to Cuba, but I'm guessing not very long in a boat going that quick. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, but, but we shouldn't discuss that because they're probably listening to us, so uh, we might, might get a knock on the door in a minute. Yeah. Well, look, that brings us on to Biomechanica and obviously a consultancy business to the industry. And you've worked with quite a few different companies over the years now, but one of the things I did want to explore is is your your connection to Runner's World and the, the shoe testing lab, which you conducted for 10 years from 2008 to 2018. How did you find that, Martin? I had a, it was a great experience for me. 
And, you know, I think uh, we were able to offer them something that they didn't have before in terms of, you know, well, haven't had for decades, let's say, because in the early days, in the 80s, Peter Kavanaugh was doing a pretty good job. But we were able to, you know, change the way that they evaluated shoes and do it in a more credible, <laughs> focused, <laughs> our evaluation based on the on the effects on the runner rather than the, or the consequences for the runner rather than on the properties of the shoe. And we kind of managed to persuade them to abandon the traditional categories of neutral cushioning, stability, et cetera, et cetera. Can I stop you there? Uh, can I stop you there for a sec? Yes. So why did you do that? Why did you feel it necessary to abandon those categories or that stratification of running footwear? Well, even though it was still used in the stores and still used by most of the brands, it wasn't really a meaningful distinction. When we took data from hundreds of shoes and did cluster analyses, you know, statistical analyses on them, we couldn't find any groupings of that type. And it was also true that by then, you know, 2008, it was also possible to have both cushioning and stability in the same product and shoes were getting much lighter. It used to be that, you know, anything less than 10 ounces was considered to be a racing flat. Now it's hard to get a shoe that's more than 10 ounces, but we could see that, see that come. So we instead looked at a variety of factors about the shoe, regarding the shoes. And basically we found our analysis that found that, well, we can put them on a, we can put them on a spectrum. And you can call it the performance protection spectrum or the less shoe, more shoe spectrum. And less shoe means at one end of the spectrum, you have what's called less shoe. That means it's lighter. So being lighter, it has less stuff, so which makes mm -hmm. it less cushioned, lower profile, more flexible, but no stability features. As you move up the spectrum towards more shoe, you get more stuff added in. Mostly, that's initially, that's cushioning, which makes the shoes be, are becoming now, these are like factors that the more shoe is a combination of increased weight, increased thickness of the sole, increased cushioning, and eventually adding in you know, more and more stability features as, as you get to the far end of the spectrum. So we put these on the shoes on the spectrum, and then we found ways of, you know, after working with lots of wear testers and lots of runners and figuring out a similar kind of spectrum for their needs, we could now start to place people you know, and make recommendations or broad recommendations, very broad recommendations based on, you know, their body size as the most important factor, their running experience, which is another complex factor that is includes you know, how many miles a week, how fast they run, how they training for competitions, how many times they compete in events in a year, so on that gives them a measure of their experience. And finally, on their injury history. And so we were able to boil that down to something that, based on the feedback we got, worked very well. And there was a simple version of that in the magazine, a complicated and much more detailed AI-driven tool online that helped people uh, select shoes. The other good thing was we uh, you know, got to have a, through Runners World and various events, got to meet with and work with and do clinics for a lot of runners and learned a lot about you know, individual goals and the reasons they run and their problems and their, uh, you know, what they are concerned about rather than what we think with or assume that they are concerned about. So, you know, actually doing clinics with hundreds of runners was a very, very big eye opener. Absolutely. And that's when I started me looking at some of the other research you're familiar with, the stuff where we just had high speed cameras at the side of the road looking at what happened. You know, most of these people are, you know, the median runner is middle aged, she's female, she's running eight to ten, you know, she's running well in Australian, she's running, you know, twelve to fifteen kilometers a week at, you know, whatever 10 to 12 minute miles are, you know, mm -hmm. and she doesn't have a big problem with it, but she's you know, running as a part of her healthy life, as part of a healthy lifestyle. It's not the only kind of exercise she does. She might be doing yoga or orange theory or some other things too, but running is a, an important part of her lifestyle. Important enough that she is on the web looking at, you know, up, filling in my questionnaires, which is how I know she's out there. Mm -hmm. So that drove the research program we did collecting data on real runners, both from you know, online surveys, in-person surveys, and making measurements of uh, gait with high-speed cameras at, in real running events, which led to lots of uh, great insights into running. Jeez, there, uh, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's into so the, the demographic of the runners and, the, and how they run. And also, as you've probably heard of grounded running now. Yep. And, you know, that we, I wouldn't say we discovered it. I think probably Australopithecus or somebody discovered it a few million years ago. But we were the first to kind of recognize it as a, as a human gate and to, and to document it. Yeah. In that last little stanza there, Martin, there's probably enough for a third session here. I, just, I, <laughs> just, I have so many yeah. questions about all of this. And, yeah. you know, one of the things that intrigues me about 
running and runners is that there seems to be no recognition of the aspirational side of it. So, you know, I get driven crazy by people I hear, they go into a store, they get asked what they're wearing, the KNO 26, okay, here's the KNO 27, proceed to the cash register. But it doesn't, running is maybe the only sport where people don't recognize that you start off as a novice and you might be overweight and you're running to lose weight. And when you come back in six months time, provided you haven't got injured, you're going to be faster, fitter, stronger, and you will have lost weight. So you really shouldn't be, you know, you should be thinking about the equipment side of it. Think of of footwear as equipment. But what I wanted to ask you is, so here we are 12 years later from 2008, and I'm not, it's much better in the USA, I think, but here in Australia, we are still dogged by retail who are still stratifying footwear. So they're still absolutely locked down on motion control, cushioning or neutral categories. Their slat wall is still arranged that way. Their staff are taught to sell shoes that way. And as you and I know, it's just, you know, the science doesn't support that in any way. No. We can't we can't match it that way. It and and sorry. Yeah, I just I just don't know how to get over that problem. You know, I mean education's obviously the key, but it seems so ingrained. And it's in the professions as well. In my profession, podiatry, uh, we still have people who are doing the old twist test and you know, if it's got a bit of flexibility, they'll reject the shoe outright no matter what, because they will say it's not it won't control motion. And I got to say, that's slightly so driving me so, mad. I think those guys had all died, but maybe not. No, they haven't all died. Well, in the US, there's still some of that, but in the you know in 2008 and before, you know, before the, it was despite all the issues and the lack of scientific underpinning and biomechanical common sense, it did kind of get people into shoes that that worked for them and that they liked. But now the problem is that you, if you have that same wall labeled in the same way. Where do you put the shoes? Because none of them, they don't fit into those categories anymore. Mm, mm, mm. And you know, where do you put a hoker that has a, a big, thick cushioned sole but weighs nine ounces? Yeah, exactly. Exactly, uh, yeah. Where do you put a, you know, a Brooks Ghost that is well cushioned, that is stable, that is lightweight, that is flexible, and is a great balance of properties? Which, well, you could put it in any one of those categories. Yeah. It's not yeah, racing think- that, but it just about is anything else that you want to do. Think- yeah, I think what you developed there with the performance protection spectrum is a good thing. I, you know, I've always sort of looked at footwear as being like a pendulum moving across the spectrum. So you may need more or less stability or more or less cushioning, or you may need a combination of both. And you bring up a very good point where you say, well, now we've got shoes that are lightweight, flexible, they have cushioning and they're stable. So where yeah. on earth do you put those? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, to summarize, Tom, just to finish up on the runner's world thing, I, it was a, a wonderful experience for me. I uh, got to work with some wonderful, dedicated people and you know, focused on runners and running and you know, just on, and on serving the running community. I got to make some contributions to that. I got to do some research and learn a lot in the, in the process. Unfortunately, the Rodale family that owned Runner's World and Men's Health, Women's Health and so on were having financial difficulties. They sold the company to a global media conglomerate whose priorities were somewhat different. Mm-hmm. And... I found that I was really unable to, I was with them for a year, but I was really unable to work with them mm. for various reasons. And when I started to start, opened up the conversation about, you know, guys, I really have difficulty working in with this new set of conditions or whatever you like. And, they, and fair enough, they were kind of concerned that they were going to have problems working with me too. So it was, <laughs> we mutually agreed not to extend the contract. <clears throat> But while I was there, it was, uh, while we were doing it, it was uh, a um, great, and I made a lot of good friends that I still have too doing that. Yeah, I mean, it's that. I guess that's you know that that's a pity that that went that way, and I, and I, I do actually sincerely think that's their loss. One thing I'd be interested in. Well, your... we're still doing review. We're still doing testing and reviews for Runners World China. If that. Oh well, there you go. I'll buy the China. How you manage it is, but they, we still do work. For that. One of the things I'd be interested to know, Martin, is. How influential were the shoe reviews? In other words, for if you're a manufacturer and you got editors, you got the editor's choice award from Runners World. What did that mean? It was huge. They would put it on display when we would go to visit the brands. We would see them on display in the foyer of their building, and it was for them. It was kind of uh, well. I think the even though we're on friendly terms with all the brands, we needed to be because we're always asking them for free shoes to test. You know, they accepted that we were you know independent and unbiased and authoritative in what we were saying. And we had very few complaints about the test results, but we did get around and say, wow, we just saw our test results. What's up? What can we do to make this product better? So I think we had a, we did have a big influence on them. We got them to change the way, instead of talking about midsoles being 10 and 20 millimeters, we got them talking about stack heights. Mm-hmm. 
and the, yep. you know the you know a runner focus. What's the what's the distance between the bottom of the runner's foot and the ground, which uh, which is more important? We got them to you know defocus some of them to defocus on categories and to look at the, look more at the at the spectrum thing. Right, right. Do you think it had a big influence on runners' purchasing habits? In other words, if a shoe got editor's choice, did people immediately identify that as being something they needed to have? Did they go out and buy more of that product? You know, we are not, you know, the part of being independent objective is that, you know, we don't look at sales figures and we don't, we don't even talk, well, we know we're friends, we don't actually do any business with the sales people in the, on the other side of the fence in the, in the organization. Mm. So I couldn't tell you that. I can mm. tell you that the, the brands were very excited about it. And I, in fact, I hope, you know, one of the uh, points we try to emphasize is that, you know, these, we didn't want to be over prescriptive. And so we were trying to identify broad classes of runner that this shoe would be, might be suitable for and who, and who they would be unsuitable for. But just because it's an editor's choice might mean it's a great all around product, or it might mean that it's a great product for a focus group of runners, but it never means that this is the best shoe for everybody. Of course, yeah. I can say from personal experience that you know a couple of the companies I've been involved with who were who had some expectations of getting an editor's choice and on a few occasions missed out were bitterly disappointed. So it obviously meant something to the companies, yeah. and you'd have to imagine that it, it meant something to the bottom line as well. I mean, it, it I can't see how it could not. I might just circle around to your comment about grounded running, Martin, because I'm sure there are a few people who are not all that familiar with that. So could you maybe just run us through what you found with that? Yes. Well, we were looking at high-speed video of runners participating in marathons, and we recorded you know, everything from you know, Boston Marathon, New York Marathon, several Portland marathons. And we recorded everybody from the elites down to the tail enders from basically from you know, two and a quarter hours to six hours, seven hours. And when we start, we we're interested in how, you know, gates varied over speed and how foot contact variations, what kind of variations of foot contact there were. So a lot of insights in those areas. But we also found out, well, we found out what people do at that awkward speed. You know, if your VO2 max is such that you are able to maintain X hours of running or, or X hours of locomotion, happens to be at that speed where neither walking or running is efficient. What you do, you know, when it, that awkward speed in between where running is too fast and walking is too slow. And what we found is, well, you know, we, we did people switch between the two? Did they skip? Did they run and stop or mix them up? Well, actually, what we found they do is something called grounded running, which is basically running. It's a bouncing gait. If you look at people coming by, they look like they're jogging. They obviously look like they're running. They're not walking. But in the colloquial popular definition, they weren't running because their feet never leave the ground. One foot, you know, the front foot heel reaches, usually the heel reaches, no, touches the ground before the toe is left off. Energetically, biologically, and biomechanically, we use a different definition to distinguish between running and walking gates, which is based on the trajectory of the center of mass and the energy exchanges. And so it is running, but it's like running at a high walking speed and they're not, never actually leaving the ground. And uh, our friend Dirk de Klerk has done some work on this and found that, uh, you know, we did some preliminary experiments on a force treadmill too that showed that it's reduces load for running at those speeds. And uh, Dirk de Klerk, our friend, has done, and his team have done uh, some more ambitious research projects and more comprehensive research projects on it and found that it's, uh, it is a more efficient gate at those intermediate awkward speeds. Yeah, he, he actually came out when I was in France. He and his whole team actually came out to ANSI and gave a uh, half-day presentation on all of that. And it was yeah. Uh, yeah, it was super interesting stuff. Yeah. So it's interesting that you said biomechanically it is running and not walking. Yes. But I would have thought one of the key features of running would have been the double float phase, which is absent in, the, uh, in ground walking, the double float no, phase. No, no. The key thing about running is that the leg is acting like a spring. It is compressing during the step, and it is at, the low point is in the middle of the step. The low point of the center of mass is in the middle step, in the middle of the step. Okay. Walking is the opposite. Right. The okay. high point of the, the center of mass is in the middle of the step, and the leg is actually extended and stiff, or basically straight in the middle of the step. So energetically, you, the exchange between potential and kinetic energy is inverted. Right. In, so in this is... Your highest potential energy and lowest, your highest potential energy is in the middle of the step and lowest between steps in the double support or the intermediate phase, which in this case is double support. In running, the potential energy is lowest in the middle of the step and highest in that intermediate phase, which in that case is the usually 
a flight phase, but is you know in the ground of running is like a there is no flight phase. There's a minimal period of double support. Okay, that's. I mean, I think that's an incredibly important point. I'm, I'm sure there'd be a few people listening who are going to have to rethink yeah, that, yeah, including, pro, including probably myself. So, you know, I think yeah, that well, the class- I, I could, if you, I could show you or show you some video of somebody running on a treadmill on a force treadmill, grounded running, and they think they're running. You look at them, you think they're running, but when you look at the high speed video or the mo- or the motion capture behind us, you you see that they are actually have a the, the foot. There's a there's a brief period of double contact. You know, it just looks and feels like running, but yeah. It, but so it is a kind of running, but it is a, and, and my, biomechanically, if we look at the changes in load and and contact time and so on, and the phases of gait and the cycle of the loads, it just falls on the line of uh, off the end of the spectrum, if you like, of running, and doesn't overlap with the walking data for those same kind of parameters. So, do you think this style of running would be protective of injury, Martin? I think so because the loads are reduced. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, um, it makes, to the extent that load is a risk factor, yeah, with lower loads. Well, I might have to pressure you for some of those videos, but how fast can you go running that way? Oh, not very fast. No, We're so it's a, about you know four arm, you know four to four arm marathon pace to you know between four and six arm marathon pace. Right, faster than you can walk, but we're still talking about the you know two to three meters per second. So we're not we're not going to see Elliot Kipchoge adopt this method anytime Absolutely soon. Absolutely not, because you you just cannot run that <laughs> uh, you just you can't run that fast with that shorter stride length. Exactly. I mean, that's I think that's a, a super important point, and I'm so glad that we had that discussion. We do need to wrap it up because I'm very aware that you've been so generous with your time. But I had a couple of things that I just wanted to pick your brain on, and that's I guess the current state of play of footwear there's no one better qualified to comment on this than you obviously we've seen some big trends you know new shoes being called the super shoes pull out your crystal ball here martin and what do you what do you think of the sustainable trends that we might see in the next three or four years yeah i still the super shoes we are finding are really only work well for super athletes Mm -hmm. and they don't work as well for you know jogger joe or the you know just regular regular runners they are wasting their money and there's some studies coming out now showing exactly that but they are great for elite athletes they and they do work they do reduce energy expenditure we don't know exactly what the combination is but the you know the mechanisms are known we know that reduced weight improves running economy mm-hmm. we know that putting a plate in there to stop the forefoot from flexing re- reduces energy dissipation and improves running economy so those are two known mechanisms but the and we we know that Cushioning, soft cushioning, reduces the cost of the physiological cost of cushioning and improves running economy. So we have all of these things in the shoes, but these uh, differ in that they have some additional features. Because you know, if you have a shoe that doesn't flex in the forefoot, you have a very awkward gait and a big lever arm. But by a, a very contoured or rocker sole, now compensates that for that lack of flexibility in the forefoot. And then the other thing is that the high energy return foams, the very resilient springy foams, it's not about trampolines because they still absorb energy in net energy. They don't produce any. But it is about if you have that much softness and that much displacement in the shoe, so it needs to come back reliably and quickly to be there you know, for the next step. And so the high energy return allows it to do that. But it's, you know, it's not still not acting like a trampoline. So the mechanisms are known. And then the other thing, Things, the features that people talk about, the highly curved rocker type soles and the high energy return foams, in my view, are there too because they compensate for the, some of the negative things that the energy saving features can introduce. Absolutely, yeah. So I think that so, will, I think when it, once the hype is over, there will be people will be using you know, the super shoes will be for super athletes. And I think some of those enhancements will come down, but hopefully not all of them because they really don't work for regular runners in the same way. But you, know, you could tune them to the jogger level, but it wouldn't be as, anything like as exciting. Yeah, where, I I see, think- more, where I see more, more exciting is, you know, increasingly we are seeing the ability to get customized insoles by, you know, scanning your foot with iPhones and sending them away. And the MP's company will send you your, your insoles or you, do pressure distribution in stores and get some customized uh, insoles that are shaped for your foot. I think they're still very early days, and I think the uh, you know the logistics. There's a lot of logistics to be sorted out, but still, you know, the whole customized footwear is continuing to evolve and to 
continuing to get better, and I think that will be a, an important trend later on. Economically, the trend, the big thing for me is that I'm always pushing, and I hope keeps other people keep pushing too. And the brands have been doing a pretty good job, but they can do better. That's sustainability. Yeah, for sure. You know, throughout the through the whole, you know, sustainability and carbon footprint through the whole product cycle. The big brands are doing a good job. Some of the factories in Asia are doing a good job, but as always, there's more to be done. Yep, absolutely. It's a key yeah. point. I just very quickly wanted to switch the discussion away from running. It doesn't, this needs to be a just an opinion from you on, do you see applications for carbon fiber plate technology in the multi-directional sports? So talking things like basketball, football, those sorts of sports. I know Nike are already using carbon plates in some of their football boots, but what are your thoughts on that? Well, the benefits that you get in a running shoe are not benefits that you need or require in a in a soccer shoe or a basketball shoe. And what you really don't want is a thick, soft sole. You want quick response, and you want you know feel for the ground and good traction, blah blah blah. So the the plates and the curvature are really very running specific. Mm-hmm. Now, yes, people will start putting plates in everything as they have done intermittently, because plates are popular, but they will I don't think they will persist because in the end they become a cost center without much benefit. So I think they will persist in running shoes. But if you know people do introduce them in court sports or field sports, then you know I mean in cycling plates and soccer plates it makes sense where you want a very stiff plate. But in basketball or tennis or other court sports, there's no there's no running economy advantage to be had really. And you know, they're detrimental to other aspects of performance. So I don't, wouldn't see the plates persisting. Uh, they will be, you will see them because it'll be a marketing thing. But they sh- I hope they don't persist in those activities. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm struggling to see the application in sports like basketball or here in Australia, yeah. netball. In football, I, I can see an advantage because there's so much sprinting involved. And, and I think you could probably design a plate that did allow movement in several but it's directions. Not economy in sprinting. And these guys are strong enough to be able to you know, use the lever that has its access at the toe rather than the metatarsal heads. And most people aren't. Plus you've got turf toe, and plus you need to have something that's stiff enough to isolate the cleats from the foot. Absolutely, yeah. Precious. So, you know, that, 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 it makes sense in cleated sports. It makes sense in cycling where you, you want that rigid lever to attach to the, to, to uh, effectively transmit force to the bike. But not to me in core sports. Yeah, I completely agree. So I'm going to wrap this conversation up by, of course, handing you the poison chalice and asking you the big question here. So in all of what we see and do in athletic footwear and the technology that is present and the technology that has been suggested and presented to us historically, how much of it is still driven by marketing and how much of it is real? Oh, there's always that conflict and it goes in phases. The big brands are... You know, very much focused and they invest millions and billions in doing into research and development, trying to get real and in, in looking at human forms and trying to get real enhancements to the product. And they're like me in many ways, people I know and work with in those brands. And I'll tell you what that is in a moment. So it's really in the smaller brands where they, where they try to sell a product and they, uh, you know, they're more likely to claim something that is not tested and proven because they don't have them. They can't afford to. They can't afford the, the high cost of research and development. And those people don't last very long because very quickly, there's a feedback loop. If things don't, if the product doesn't meet people's expectations, then they stop buying it. Yeah, and you sure. know, that, those brands go away. I say the people I know in the business like me, I'm really not into shoes. <laughs> I'm not into running shoes or sports shoes of any kind or athletic shoes, but I'm really into the people that use them. <laughs> I've to the athletes and the sportsmen and the exercises and active people. So for me, it's all about, you know, it's not about the shoes. It's about those people. And I think the, you'll find that there are a lot of people working at the brands that feel the same way. Plus, you know, when you go to New Balance and talk to their product people, you're not going into a smoke-filled room with a bunch of guys in stripy suits smoking on their cigars and talking about the economy. You are talking to a group of people who are actually themselves, you know, marathon runners and joggers and participants in all this, you know. And until recently, the head of marketing at New Balance was, for example, was a woman who spent her weekends working towards the goal of running a marathon in every all 50 states of the United States. Mm-hmm. So, these, you know, these people aren't back there in the smoke-filled rooms cooking up ways to trick runners. They are part of the running community. Mm. And they are out there, and, you know, they could be right there next to you in the 10K at 
some your local event or to a full marathon. You know, they are part of the running community and they're not, you know, they're, the idea that they're trying to, you know, trick people into buying this stuff, in my view, is just uh, a fantasy conspiracy theory. The, yeah, that's... Uh, but these are real people that are, you know, have actually have integrity and really want to, you know, they are part of this community and they're trying to do the best they can for that community. They don't always get it right. Sometimes they make mistakes, but, they, you know, their intentions are generally good. Yeah, I'm so glad you said that because I do get quite annoyed. I often feel comments or, you know, questions on social media with people just saying it's all just marketing hype. And, you know, I look at what Nike have done with the Vaporfly and the Alphafly and people yeah. saying oh, it's all just hype and marketing, but they've got no understanding of no. just the blood, sweat and tears that went into producing yeah. something quite fantastic, frankly. And the 30 plus PhDs that were involved in establishing the science and validating it. Yeah, absolutely. And sort of the lineage, it's not something that's, it's like being an overnight sensation as a rock band. It's a, it just doesn't happen. You've got to yeah. put in years of hard work to get to that point. So I think that's a very valuable take home message for people. Well, yeah, of these companies, like any other business, are beholden to their shareholders. But, you know, one way of doing a good job for your shareholders and, and growing your business is to do a good job for your customers. Absolutely. And that is basically the strategy that most of these people are trying to. That's what they're trying to do in order to grow the businesses. Yeah, there's always a commercial reality. And the commercial reality, if you're an athletic footwear brand, is to sell shoes. But it doesn't mean that you do that in an underhand way at all. I think we better leave it there, Martin. That's a great way to finish off. Thank you. you. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Keep yourself well. And hopefully when all this passes, we will see each other face to face sometime soon. I hope so soon. Yeah, if you're ever on the... In the northwest of the United States, we'll be here. I'll come and visit. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you, Simon. Take care. Thanks for joining us for the Shoe Warrior podcast by Bartold Clinical. Join us next time 